Hi everybody, welcome to our message for today. Today I'm going to be reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, 1 to 11. It's Palm Sunday and the start of Holy Week. And we start that journey, don't we, with Jesus to the cross and through the other side to life. So today we begin our journey on Palm Sunday and I've um, got a little palm plant here just for the occasion. Um, But let me read to you from Mark's Gospel. Like I said, I'm reading from chapter 11, starting at verse 1. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying this colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Psalm 118 verse 25 from the King James Version and it's the cry of Hosanna. That's what the people were crying as they saw Jesus come into the holy city. Israel had been slaves in Egypt for as long as they and their ancestors could remember. The king of Egypt had set them free. An unbelievable reality they could never have dreamt of and they were having a hard time accepting the truth of it. But all of a sudden they were trapped again. Their cynicism and worst fears seemed to have been confirmed. They'd been set free but the king of Egypt must have changed his mind. It was all too good to be true after all. The king of Egypt's army appeared over the crest of the hill on one side and to the other side of them, the deep blue unpassable sea loomed. They were trapped. They had no way out, no way made for them. They needed saving. We know the story well, don't we? And can read it again in Exodus chapter 14. As God's people, it's imprinted onto our psyche. God parted the Red Sea for his people and made a way for them, didn't he? He got them out of that sticky spot. He saved them. The Israelites escaped the terror of the king of Egypt. God defeated him. God rescued his people from an impossible situation, showing his power and might. He redeemed them by bringing them through the waters. He made a way for them. Next week on Easter Sunday down at Sudbury Baptist Church, we'll be remembering that truth again and seeing it for ourselves. We'll be seeing the culmination of those Exodus events as we see four people get baptised. They'll also pass through the waters to the promised land of life and love in Jesus Christ, leaving their life of slavery to sin behind them. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity, says the King James Version. Let's look at our passage again in Mark's Gospel. And if you haven't got it in front of you already, I encourage you to get it out. 
as the crowds gathered in Jerusalem and the surrounding villages the week before Jesus died. This ancient story of God's salvation from Exodus would be ringing in their ears and bursting in their hearts. The Passover festival was time when families gathered and the identity as God's people was reveled in and celebrated. Jesus was on his way up from Jericho, the lowest city on earth. I don't know if you knew that already. All the way up to Jerusalem. That's a near 4,000 feet to climb through hot, dry and arid desert. To the top of the Mount of Olives, pilgrims for centuries had been making the same journey, dancing and singing in delight when at last they saw a glimpse of the holy city, Jerusalem, Zion from the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem, the place in which God of the universe had blessed with his name and his presence. The Psalms of Ascent, which we can find, can't we, in Psalms 120 to 134, they're like a neat little book tucked away in the Psalms, are songs about his, this very journey up the dry and dusty mountain to the holy city, when God's people would come and remember and celebrate their salvation being saved by God and they'd sing songs such as I lift my eyes up to the hills from where will my help come my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth and then another I was glad when they said to me let us go to the house of the Lord our feet are standing within your gates O Jerusalem and yet another those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion which cannot be moved. These were songs of salvation to their God because God had saved them. They worshipped a saving God. Many, gener many generations before the prophet Zechariah had prophesied the eventual triumph of God's King, God's Messiah over all the earth. His reign over God's people is pictured in Zechariah chapter 14. And this apocalyptic passage portrays important future events. But most amazingly, a picture of God making a way for his people to be saved. Chapter 14 reads, that day his feet, talking about God's feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. The whole chapter of Zechariah 14 is a picture of describing how the Lord will make a way for his people from destruction and judgment to salvation. Imagine the huge, hot, dry mountain the pilgrims climb to reach that site of the glorious Jerusalem. From the lowest point on earth to one of its highest. Imagine now it being split in two to create a wide valley. I'm sure that thought had crossed many pilgrims' minds as they struggled and laboured up that Jerusalem road. So what's Mark's message? The message is this, that God will make a way for his people to be saved. And in Jesus, he has made that way. At the start of our passage today, we see Jesus, the King of Kings, God himself, with his feet on the Mount of Olives, about to make that very way. That's why Mark mentions Bethpage and Bethany and the Mount of Olives at the start of our passage. Jesus is ready to split the very fabric of existence to bring salvation to all who would turn to him and follow. Even now at the start of Holy Week, the cross of Calvary is in view. Jesus' gaze and direction is set and his mission is clear. Only a king can bring salvation to his people, can't he? 
Only the King of the Universe can bring salvation to the whole world. Mark, the writer of this gospel, is keen to show that Jesus is not just a revolutionary teacher. He's not just a miracle work worker, but that he is that very king. Jesus is the king who is about to reclaim his holy city and make a way of salvation, not only for not only from Egypt's king and enforced slavery like back in Exodus, but from the greatest evil of all, which is behind all other evils, sin, the Satan and death. And not just for the Israelites, but for all who would put their trust in him. In our passage today, there are three ways that Mark shows us that Jesus is king. Firstly, he commandeers a young colt, doesn't he? In these days, the only people who rode animals were royalty. For the whole of Mark's gospel, Jesus walks everywhere. In fact, the gospel is known for its rapid narrative. Jesus is portrayed to be walking from here to there, ministering and teaching about the coming kingdom of God. Only here in this passage does Mark portray Jesus riding on an animal. Mark doesn't even tell us it's a donkey. Only later Gospels tell us this information. Mark's Gospel was probably the first one to be written and all the other Gospels probably used bits of Mark's Gospel to put together their own um, record of events. Mark tells us it's a colt, a young horse or a donkey that had never been ridden. Mark isn't focusing on the fact of Jesus's humility here, which is often associated with Jesus riding on a donkey. Although, of course, we know that to be true. But Mark is making the point of Jesus's royalty. His importance and standing as the king. He has the kingly right to ride on an animal into the city. On an animal that has not been ridden by anyone else before. Whether Jesus had prearranged the use of this animal or he divinely knew he could use it, it doesn't really matter. The point is that he commandeered it. In a similar way, a police officer has the authority to commandeer your vehicle in an emergency. A king had the right to use someone else's animal for his own purpose. Yet Jesus assures that the animal will, will be returned immediately. Obeying the law of God played, laid down in Leviticus. Jesus does everything perfectly as usual and is in tune with God's ways, which the law is all about. He's not looking for signs to make himself king. He is king by right. He is king naturally and therefore he does all this naturally. Mark then describes how the disciples place their cloaks upon the animal for Jesus to sit on. As he entered the holy city and a cloak would have been a normal person's most expensive possession. It was expensive to weave and was good material. It kept the cold, the heat, the sun, the wind, the dust, the muck out and operated like a cocoon to live inside whilst travelling. His disciples lay their treasured possessions, revealing their vulnerability to the elements as a makeshift throne for the king to sit on. In a moving way, they cast their crowns before their king, giving up their own comfort for his comfort, another sign of his royalty and kingship. As this band of loyal subjects follow Jesus into Jerusalem, so other pilgrims join the parade Perhaps they see what the disciples are doing, their actions towards Jesus, the sight of Jesus riding in on a new colt into the city. This all speaks louder than words. This was a king entering Jerusalem. The people gather foliage and branches from the fields and lay them before Jesus, making a way for him. 
They follow the example of the disciples and lay their own cloaks before him to making a bed or a path for Jesus to pass upon. At the beginning of Mark's Gospel, who records how John the Baptist called for everyone to straighten out their lives and be ready for the Lord's arrival. Well, here that is happening. Make way for the Lord. As they follow, they sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now, I beseech thee. O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. This was a huge political statement at a major Jewish festival and deeply reminiscent of another event that had happened 200 years before. 200 years before, a man called Judas Maccabeus had ridden into Jerusalem in the same fashion and liberated Jerusalem from the Syrians, cleansing the temple and setting up a Jewish dynasty that would last a hundred years. He rode in as a king and Jesus does the same. He rides in as the long awaited king of freedom, ready to liberate his people. But as Holy Week unfolds, we watch how Jesus' kingship takes the very different shape from the previous kings. Different, in fact, to any other king before or since. Jesus radically redefined kingship, didn't he? This was not the sort of royalty that Israel or the rest of the world were used to. Jesus didn't spill his enemy's blood or wreak violence upon them to accomplish salvation for his people. Instead, he spilt his own blood and took their violence upon and into himself. In fact, as Holy Week continues, we see the crowd that claims him as their king here quickly turn upon him and call for his crucifixion. Jesus' kingship is radically different and is puzzling to us as well. Do we recognise it in our own lives? Are we like the disciples ready to lay down our property and comfort before him? Are we prepared to go out of our way to find our own equivalent cloaks? Lay them at his feet and make a way for him to come? Are we, even though Jesus, are we, even though Jesus' ways of salvation seem puzzling to us at times, prepared to give him our obedience as our king? Or have we so trivialised and domesticated our Christian commitment and our devotion to Jesus himself that we look on him as simply someone to help us through the things we want to do anyway? In our world, most countries don't have kings or queens anymore. And those that do don't really have any real power. Perhaps Palm Sunday gives us an opportunity to rethink what true kingship and true royalty is. As we watch the King of Kings ride into Jerusalem about to save his people.